Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Diane Burko, and in keeping with American University's commitment to pursuing inclusive excellence, I'm following one of their practices shared from our indigenous and native communities to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meeting with the goal to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nakachitank, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. I'd also like to begin this session by acknowledging the original moderator, Maggie Stodner, the director of the environmental film program here at American University. Unfortunately, Maggie is unable to be with us today and she asked me to take her place. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be taking her place uh, being that I'm the inspiration for the Seeing Climate Change Symposium. And so far it's really been a rewarding experience, quite gratifying. And I hope some of you have been with us since last night and will continue to be with us. And if not, this will be recorded uh, and you will get notice of that when those recordings are ready. She, Maggie, like me, is a creative person and someone who believes in making the invisible both visual and visceral. And the people who are with us today, and that is Lauren Bond, Jesse Rebo, Monica Jahan Bose, and Signe Wilkinson are all practitioners, creative people who are doing that and contributing to the language and the communication about climate change. So um, I'm going to give you some brief bios about our four panelists, and then each of them will speak to you individually about their practice. We're going to start with Lauren Bonn, who is an artist and landscape architect and someone who I first met in 2017, I think, right, Lauren? It was right. at the Art and Environment Conference in Nevada, Nevada Art Museum. And I was very taken uh, by her talk, although I knew her practice as well. Uh, actually, Lauren, I don't know if you know this, my husband is from Ridgecrest, California. Oh. So uh, I've been to... <laughs> Long time. Yes, yes. And, and I still remember seeing the pipeline going into LA and of course, Chinatown, the movie. Uh, so I've been connected to the, the water wars for quite a while. And Lauren is someone who is not merely connected, but she's doing something about it. Uh, Lauren's practice, Metabolic Studio, explores the self-sustaining and self-diversifying systems of exchange that feed emergent priorities that regenerate our life web. And um, the keynote that we just had earlier was all about the web, the web of life that, you know, um, Alexander von Humboldt first spoke about. But it's about climate change. It's about the pandemic. And it's really, I think, what Lauren is involved with. And she will tell you about that. Another uh, famous connection to Lauren is her participation in the 2019 Venice Biennale where we had this blasting sign that said, artists need to create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. And if anyone is doing that in our world of artists, it is Lauren Bond. Her projects are immense, they're ambitious and courageous, and she is a woman who's getting things done. And Lauren, I, I know you're gonna speak 
about that, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Our next speaker will be Jesse Rebo, and Jesse comes to this theme. Um, I what 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 do we call our panel again? Jesse, oh, you can unmic yourself now, so you can. Um, Making climate change visible. Okay. Thank you. And Jesse is someone who does that from a very academic, I, I might say, vantage point um, in a good sense. Okay. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that Jesse's research is based in social and political economic causes of precarity and social suffering in the natural resource dependent communities. And I watched that wonderful film of yours, Jesse, uh, the other day, which was great. I know we're gonna see your animation. And what Jesse is focusing on, well, all his field work, I think, um, was West African Sahal, and mostly uh, Eastern Senegal. And what he focuses on is the fact that when you talk about climate refugees, he's going to adjust that for you and, and talk about what that really is about, that it's not necessarily about the climate as much as it is about the systems and the structures that are in place and the inequities that exist that you have been researching for many, many years. Uh, and he, he has methods that are drawn from sociology, anthropology, and geography. And the fact that you've taken those, Jesse, and somehow channeled them in a narrative way, I, I think is very commendable because we, all of us on this panel, the whole, um, our thrust is to bring knowledge to the public forum, to the community so that people can understand it. And people understand through many ways. Um, and our next speaker is someone who has really a social practice, I would say. And uh, that is Johan, Monica Johan Bose. Monica is an attorney. Hi, Monica. You can unmic yourself too. Uh, Monica is an attorney and, and a Bangladeshi American artist and a climate activist. And it's amazing, Monica, how you've just meshed again those that that knowledge base together in a way that brings these issues out into the community through dance, through your social practice, through so many beautiful, beautiful performances that you have organized and done over the years. And uh, she's done performance projects that really span a whole gamut. And I hope that you will be speaking about that. It's about storytelling. I think if we synthesize it, right, Monica, it's you're telling stories and coming from Bangladesh. I mean, here we are, COP26 still going on. And what communities in the world are impacted? Certainly many of them below the equator, certainly the Pacific Island communities, and certainly Bangladesh in terms of um, you know, water, to say the least. So Monica is gonna be speaking to us about that. And our last speaker is Signe Wilkinson. <clears throat> Signe is someone I actually know because we're both hailing from the great city of uh, sisterly and brotherly love. Philadelphia. And Signe is a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. Another vehicle, another narrative that can talk to these issues. And you know, in the uh, panel we had last night, one of the questions in the audience was, what about social media? What about ways to reach a public that doesn't go to the art museum where my exhibition is? And Signe, I think, you can unmike, I think Signe is someone who does that in, in the public arena? I mean, God, how many years were you in published newspapers working? I can't remember. I think it was 150, but I can't <laughs> remember now. <laughs> Probably more like 40. Yes. Okay. I think it was 35. I have my notes on you. Um, but but you're still you're still active and you're still on. I love your Instagram cartoons because in a nutshell, this woman is able to really just nail it. And I'm hoping that you're going to show us some examples of that today. Okay, so I think we're going to begin, and I'm sure I've left out a great deal. Um, every one of you have such long resumes and accomplished so much. I'm sure people will understand that as you begin talking about your practice. 
And so, Lauren, I'm going to go to you first and ask you to tell us about what you do. Hi. So, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Lauren. I go by she, they pronouns. I'm calling in this morning from Topanga, from the Santa Monica Mountains, Chumash Territory, on a beautiful, sunny, autumnal Southern California day. Um, and um, I'm so thankful to be a part of this conversation today. Um, thank you, Diane, and thank you, American University, for hosting this symposium. I wanted to also acknowledge that we've just passed New Moon in Virgo, and one of the big questions that I ask myself during this time and I ask others is, what do we need to take with us into this darkest time of the year? And I think for me, my practice with Metabolic Studio is really thinking about a space for caring, a space for empathy, a space for relationship to the web of life. And what that means for us is really a practice of cultivating invisible gardens. It's all that unseen and mysterious material that supports the complex interweave we call the web of life, the mycelial layer, its relationship to the plant kingdom, its relationship to photosynthesis and light and water, um, and, and how this is in a constant state of fluctuation. But also thinking about the brevity of human experience and how we are locked into a span of thinking that has often been described as the seven generation rule. We're able to imagine two generations before us and two generations after us, but we find the edges of that very, very complex. So the real question as we move into darkness is how do we make space in this conversation about sixth mass extinction, climate change, and how culture can, what culture can be in this time of, of darkness? I think for us right now, especially just following um, the Day of the Dead commemoration. It's also to think about making space for active grieving as part of the performative aspect of um, what we need to be doing. So in particular, um, I'm thinking about this, we, us just passing the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, I know that Washington DC itself was a target um, and experienced massive trauma 20 years ago around this time, around autumn. And I think that we really need to kind of unpack the suffocation context that this conversation is happening in. In the 20 years since 9-11, we've spent $6.4 trillion on the war on terror. And I think that has a lot to be taken to task for in, 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 in what we can do as individuals. How can we question our tax dollars? How can we question um, the structures, the patriarchal structures that control our infrastructure uh, and, 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 and think about that in connection to, you know, the culture that we're living in. So I wanted to at least begin by saying, you know, how big is here? What are we all on this call connected to? Well, we're connected to cultural history and to the grief that in many ways got catalyzed by 9-11. It was in that rubric that I re realized, what happens if my credit card doesn't work anymore? It may be important to know my neighbors. It may be important to understand how to participate in a co-creative strategy, which involves um, growing food, making tools. I mean, all of the things that are part of our epigenetic knowledge of how to survive. So everything that I've learned about this, this kind of cultural approach that involves responsibility really comes by just practicing. And it started for me 
the very first thing that was part of the metabolic cycle came by accident, like most of the things in my practice. I was camping on Catalina Island. I woke up in the morning and my tent was surrounded by buffaloes. I found out that those buffaloes were brought to Catalina Island from the Lakota Sioux um, by filmmakers in the early part of the 20th century. They were filming Zane Gray's The Vanishing Americans. And after the film vanished from the site, the buffalo were left behind. They had outgrown their biotone and were then being sold for dog food off, off of Catalina Island. So the very first thing that I was able to do in this cycle of thinking post 9-11 was think about the importance of repatriatizing those buffalo. We organized a complex social practice which allowed for those buffaloes to be moved back to the Lakota Sioux. And along that journey, Oh, that's my five minute timer. Along that journey, um, I was given some seed, which allowed me to um, plant, not a cornfield, a 32 acre cornfield in downtown Los Angeles, which involved nine, 90 miles of irrigation stripping. Um, and that stripping was um, needed to be fed by a water supply and if we have time at the end of this, I will segue into how that water supply has led into a 15 year practice, which is now involving a infrastructure adaptation of the LA River's low flow channel, a redirection of a small part of the low flow channel um, in terracotta pipes under the LA River to be lifted by a self-propelled mechanism, a water wheel moved by the power of water into a native garden to be cleansed and then distributed to a network of public places. Um, and uh, that's where we are currently. We've uh, laid the first 300 feet of those pipes under the LA River. We needed to get 78 federal, state and local permits in order to do something quite logical, which is simply use a resource that we've already used that's been cleansed and moving out to sea in order to create a new spreading ground for the artificial LA aqueduct watershed as a way of paying homage to the snow cap that falls on the Eastern Sierra 240 miles away um, so that we can enter a new century of water management with a deeper acknowledgement of the source of our water in the snow caps far away from our city. I'll end with that, Diane, and um, look forward to discussing more in the conversation. That's wonderful. And, and uh, that was the project I hope you would speak about. I've been watching it on Instagram for the last, I don't know how long. Uh, there's always a posting, it seems, on a Friday. And the progress is just overwhelming. The videos that you've posted are incredible. And um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions about it um, in the discussion time that we will have. We, Next, just, to, just to say that my uh, one of my studio team members is um, going to be adding links to that project on the chat bar because it's not something I could go through in five minutes. So for anybody who wants that uh, info and links, the chat bar will be populated by them. Thank you very much. We would appreciate that. Now we're going to turn to Jesse Repo, who uh, I found out we have a mutual friend in Ben Orlov, an uh, anthropologist and climate activist friend of mine. Jesse, take it away. Thanks, Diane. I am so honored to be on with artists. My own poetry, film, and sculptures, a couple of which are in front of you now, those are my human nature series where I tried to figure out what does it mean when humans began transforming or begin transforming nature. So I decided to make some rocks. They were nature made by a human, so I called them human nature. But as you see, they kind of look human. I used them in an installation about migration. But in any case, my own poetry film sculpture came out or emerged quite organically because of the world out there 
which is too absurd to describe in academic terms. Now, I'm a scholar, and to me, academic is a very positive word. It means rigorous. Uh, it is not something that says, oh, that's academic, get rid of it. I, I, it really does mean rigorous, and we need to be rigorous about all of what we engage with, including our artwork. And I think all of the artwork I've seen in, uh, of the people on this program is quite rigorous. Reality is really complex and contradictory. And that I think is why art simplifies how we present it to the world. I love Diane's works of art. Uh, they make earth and climate change quite visible. They map us into the world. I think however, that climate change is already very visible. It's visible to just about anyone uh, other than those who see it, but deny it and can't tolerate it. Those with eyes open see it everywhere. Yet, quite importantly, my own work has been on the disasters associated with climate change. And I think more is occluded than climate change. More is hidden than climate change. We need to see a lot more. And what we need to see is vulnerability. Vulnerability is that condition on the ground that people live in that turns a climate event, a hazard, into a disaster. Without vulnerability, there is no crisis. Without the hazard, there is no crisis. So we need to see vulnerability. Uh, it is incredibly important if we are to live in a sustainable but just world. And that's the kind of world I want. I don't want to put justice aside at any moment. Sustainability requires justice. And justice is why we care about sustainability. Climate change, unfortunately, is covering a lot of that up. Too much focus on climate change at the expense of seeing the vulnerabilities that turn these climate events into crises. Occlusions by climate change include the covering up of vulnerability, precarity, exploitation, expropriation of people's lands, violence against indigenous peoples, violence against other poor rural people and poor urban people, policies and practices that cause vulnerability and thus cause these things we call climate disasters. I'll put on that video and I'll give you a quick example of this. On April the 19th, 2015, a boat sank on its way from Libya to Italy. 700 of the 729 people on board died that day. The media refers to these people as climate refugees or climate migrants, implying that they made this hazardous journey to get away from the impact of climate change. However, a group of researchers went to the Tambacunda Oops. region of Senegal, where many of the drowned migrants came from, to ask their families why they abandoned their homes to journey toward Europe. And they actually tell a very different story. They don't talk about the weather. They speak of being excluded from markets, having low prices for their crops, lack of social services, and inadequate political representation to articulate their aspirations and defend their needs. They also talk about a lack of hope. They see no future in Tambacunda. In villages of Tambacunda, men are expected to marry and provide for their family, but the lack of opportunities makes them feel useless, precarious and powerless. Staying at home simply feels like social death to these young men. So they decide to make the dangerous trip to Europe, where they see a way to find respect, to become adults and to make their people proud by contributing to family and community at home. The goal of going to Europe is not to escape climate change or war, another common narrative about migrants. These young men are seeking a life of dignity. Climate change is real and is causing additional stress on already vulnerable people. But the claim that climate change is the driving force behind migration from the Sahel focuses our efforts on the wrong initiatives. Indeed, Tambacunda's farmers are precariously perched at the edge of disaster, 
due to policies and practices that allow economic exploitation. A normal and expected drought or any other fluctuation in political stability or the economy can then push these farmers over the edge. So, the question we must be asking is, why are these people on the edge in the first place? Why do Sahelian farmers always live on the brink of hunger? Why do they lack public services and social safety nets? Why don't their local and national governments represent them or respond to their needs? Why do international development agencies channel support for rural development to non-governmental organizations rather than to the elected local governments that know and represent them? By only focusing on climate change as the driving force of migration, we are erasing the histories and existing knowledge of crises and their many local, national, international, social and politico-economic causes. The problem is not immigration and the cause is not climate. The problem is a lack of a secure, dignified life and the causes are many. Causes are located within policy and practice of governments and markets. They are located in state-supported extractive economies. They are located in a lack of political representation. People need to retain the benefits of their own labor. They need access to resources and markets. They need social security, and they must be represented in creating the very policies that shape their lives. So, the real issue has always been the most complex of them all. What kind of policies and institutions allow for people to move back from the cliff of precarity what kinds of policies allow them to live with security, hope and dignity? How can we strengthen local and national democracy to make local and national governments responsive to their citizens so they might help build a secure economy by and for the people? Okay. So I made that animation. I worked with animation artists because of the long frustration of trying to get across the simplest things. People come out there and want to do climate proofing when these people are being exploited and they are keeping so little of the wealth that they generate in their farming because it's just taken away and sold in international markets. That is to me wrong. And so it's important to see this. And what's incredible is local people see it very clearly. I wrote a children's book, and this is one image from it. It says on this guy's, the, the colonial forest officer's book, it says rule book. And what I wrote, if I can remember it right, is look, here in the rule book, which you must obey, you have rights to the things that we don't take away, but we can't take the wood without taking the trees. So you'll have to make do with the stumps and some seeds. You can grow village woodlots, eucalyptus and pine will help you to manage them through incentives and fines. If you listen, look, learn, and do as we say, even democratization will be on its way. We must protect forests from people like you so that people with business will have business to do. The world is absurd and every peasant farmer in Senegal, when a forestry project comes along and says, oh, we're gonna manage the forests, for you and help you knows that they're being exploited in the process of environmental management. And these are the kind of injustices, if we want environmentalism to become something that local people can take on, these are the kind of things we have to understand as well and make very visible. And yesterday in the session that uh, was held at the museum, there was a young man from Uganda who spoke and basically said, how can people who cannot survive day to day deal with the questions of climate change? Anyway, thank you. And I'm really delighted to be on this panel with all of you. Thank you, Jesse. And you know, remember I did answer him and I said, tune in tomorrow because you have spoken to that and so did Mustafa Ali in the keynote that came right before our panel. Um, you've done a beautiful job, and I just love the way you've positioned climate change in this bigger context, because it is about the power structure, about the patriarchy, and about everything having to readjust if we're going to survive. And you're Absolutely. doing 
yeah, you're doing a, a great job of, of, of helping that move forward. And um, I'm going to turn now to our last speaker, who I think is also doing a great job, and that's Signe Wilkinson. Uh, Signe, let's see you come aboard. Um, as I said earlier, she How is. Monica? Monica? Oh, I'm sorry. Monica, is bef I have the order mixed up. Forgive me. Monica, you're next, then Signe. Like I said, I'm, I'm a pitch-in moderator for this, so please forgive me. Monica, will you unmute yourself? Yes. Yes. Hello. And Good. Hi, everyone. Go ahead, Monica. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Monica Jahan Bose, and I'm uh, here in Washington, D.C. And I'm actually going to ask um, Sarah Leary to, to play um, a short excerpt from a film that I'm working on with uh, Lena Jaiswal. I wrote on the story about riding a bike. Uh, instead of driving. I really like the way that we were able to bring the sorry to life with artwork and also with our promise to uh, help with climate change. The types of things that we learned about climate change was to just plant more trees, cut off lights when you're not using them, walk instead of driving your car. Oh my gracious, it was such a unity of spirit. We were one as a team working together, putting uh, the stories together for our sisters in Bangladesh. I could feel them, I could feel even some of the plight of uh, just being a woman and being uh, sensitive to maybe some of the things that they have gone through or are going through, um, similar to women here. Hi, um, Sarah, can you put the slide up now? So, um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to um, uh, thank everyone for inviting me um, to be here. And I wanted to uh, uh, touch, uh, touch on a couple of things that, um, that prior speakers mentioned. Um, uh, Lauren Bond um, was talking about co-creation. And that is, I think, one of the things that um, I'm doing. Um, I'm actually uh, working across disciplines. Um, I'm an artist and I also do advocacy. And the, and the Sari project, Storytelling with Saris, is a project I started nine years ago with um, a dozen women from my ancestral village in Bangladesh. And this is a picture of the first set of Saris that we made together. I'm wearing one of the saris right now. Next slide, please. Um, so the island um, that my um, foremothers are from is um, Barobaishta Island in, um, in the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean in southern Bangladesh. It takes about 30 hours to get there by boat from Dhaka. Next. And I always talk about my foremother, my uh, grandmother, Jahora Begum. She was married at age seven. She's a um, climate and she was a climate and cyclone survivor. She also uh, made sure that all her daughters finished high school. My mother was the first girl from the village to finish high school. Um, I started being, I was mainly working on paintings, a whole series of paintings about climate change um, that I started in 2005. Um, and then I decided that I really wanted to, as, as um, uh, Diane Burko mentioned, get into a, a more socially engaged practice. And I was also doing eco empowerment work on the, in the village since the year 2000. But I wanted to actually work with the women um, to try to uh, uh, in include them directly in my practice next. And so I started making wood blocks because I thought, well, they should teach me what they know how to do. And they had been trained in wood block printing. And also the textile work is the main creative output of women in Bangladesh. Next. So we started, I designed a bunch of wood blocks and uh, based on input from them. And we started making these saris and it's, it's continuing today. These saris um, are worn. They're used in performances. They're used in public art. They're used in workshops. Next. And then as you saw from the video, I started making saris with Americans and Europeans and trying to connect um, uh, people from here to there through this kind of uh, medium of this massive fabric. And also I learned so much about, um, about uh, sustainability from the women of my ancestral village. They all had solar panels on their roof and they really shamed me by saying, oh, Monica, you don't have one? Next. So I started doing... Um, 
I started installing, I installed solar panels on my roof. I thought, you know, I, uh, if these people in Bangladesh can afford to do it, then certainly me as a wealthy American can do it. And I started having solar sorry, sorry, solar sorry salons in my house and encouraging people to switch to green energy. Um, and a lot of, um, a lot of people did actually. So next, a lot of my neighbors have also put up solar panels. And then the, um, the voices, the stories, the saris um, from these women of Katakali have been used in multiple ex um, exhibitions. Um, uh, and in, in, I started making films. My first um, three channel film was with a filmmaker called Nanita Ahmed um, in my in the exhibition called Layer by Layer next. And um, I also have, the, the women are also keeping journals for the last nine years. Um, it's kind of, these are women that did not know how to learn, to, did not know how to read, but have now learned to read and have been writing their stories and their, their experience of climate change. They're keeping climate and other journals, which I'm, um, which I'm trying to preserve because otherwise they might get washed away and they're used in installations as well. Next. And then I've been doing performances with women in different places around the world to, and using these worn saris to connect us physically. Um, and connect us, I, I take the performances that are usually outdoors because I really believe in this idea of unitivism, the, the, our, our link, uh, this web between that connects us with our earth, with the earth and everything in it. Next. These are eco-feminist performances. And then in Bangladesh, the work there continues as well. I'm trying to use whatever knowledge I have to share with people there. I organized a um, climate conference in the village in um, 2015 with the International Center for Climate Change and Development. We had 200 people attend that conference, um, including children and women. And next, and a lot of strategies came out of that conference. And I've tried to help as much best as I can, um, help the, the women there realize what they, what they want to do. And one of the things that they came up with was planting more coconut trees because coconut trees prevent erosion um, and they also stop storm surge if you have a whole bunch of them along the shore and they're dying at a faster rate now because of salt incursion and of course they they also provide clean water so we have this coconut nursery project that was started in 2016 after the conference and that's going i've also tried to um, do these workshops with them when i do go there um, um, writing workshops i have uh, writing skills and these women can, can read and write a little bit now but this was the first time that they wrote letters to their government to ask for help next um, and then um, I've done these performances in, with women in Paris um, next these same saris um, were used um, for a project in Athens about migration and uh, links to climate change um, called footprint apotipoma and there are a lot of workshops with refugees that I did on saris there too next and uh, some of the saris went to the global climate action summit the women leaders summit in um, in San Francisco next and, uh, and I've also been working, so I'm really trying to connect the community in Washington, D.C., where I'm from, to my original ancestral village. So all the people of D.C., and this is a, you know, D.C. Is a, is, a, is a city of majority people of color. We've been making saris together. We've been doing public art projects together, co-creating 65 saris next to cover five historic buildings in Anacostia. Um, and they have all kinds of, and it went on, the project was a nine-month project with multiple workshops. Um, and the workshops involve a lot of climate knowledge sharing next. And I found that people were writing poetry. So I've really gotten into poetry now. So I uh, really enjoyed um, hearing the last speaker's poems. Um, so we've been doing climate justice poetry. We've been doing open mics. We've also um, gone into sculpture. Um, my next project actually is called Sustain and it's going to be um, doing uh, planting and connecting with plants um, and uh, trying to, I think, yeah, I think we're, we are in a, in a in a, in a dark time and uh, a place where we need to um, grieve and, and, and figure out how to survive um, next. And um, what I'm planning to do, next slide please, is to continue this project. It was gonna be a 10 year project, but it has been really amazing to, to work with these women in Bangladesh and to connect their stories with people here. Um, I'm trying to, it's gonna keep going for the rest of my life. It's sort of the project that's uh, taken over my practice. Um, so I'm documenting the actual lives of women in the face of climate change. I'm amplifying their voices as they become climate justice leaders. I'm also trying to see how climate conditions evolve. I've already seen a lot change and documented in the last nine years. There's incredible storms that have destroyed the crop four out of five years, um, the last few years in the, in the southern parts of Bangladesh. And these women farmers are really, really suffering. I'm also trying to collect the intangible heritage in Katakali and DC in 
case we lose it because there's not much um, uh, you know um, value given um, by our um, capitalist society um, to this kind of intangible heritage of songs and food knowledge and and poetry and I'm also trying to bring build black brown solidarity at the intersection of climate gender and racial justice and I do think that community engagement and building community is the key to solving climate change and environmental injustice and that it's also um, these actions these small actions that I'm doing are also strategies to reduce carbon footprint in the US so that people actually make pledges on saris to make direct um, direct action in their own home and their own communities to reduce climate change so thank you so much for allowing me to share so well, last night we talked about to be a feminist is an environmentalist and you are such a shining example, Monica, of that practice. I'm overwhelmed by all you have done. Oh, well, thank you. Boggling. You are the activist. You're fantastic. And you're another example of how people bring all of their knowledge together and do the, do the thing we have to do. And you're hopeful. One of the things that Moha, um, Mustafa said today um, uh, it was, you know, no, it wasn't him. I think it was Jennifer Morgan, the head of Greenpeace International, who's an AU graduate. She said to be, to be hopeful is to be courageous. And uh, you've, I just love the way you've joined communities because you're right. This is one of the ways that we can really bring people at the ground level into the issue. And after all, that's what it takes. We have the power if we use it. And I think you're using it brilliantly. Thank you so much. And now I will turn to, to Signe Wilkinson, um, our last speaker, who also has powerful messages. And I'm looking forward, Signe, to you showing us some of your stuff. Thank you, Diane, and AU for hosting this. Uh, but I have to warn people, we're going from Diane Verko's beautifully painted high art to the low down printed on newspaper cartoon art. And we're also going from Lauren's immense scale and ambition to a tiny little square. But um, those squares, those cartoon squares uh, can pack a feeling, uh, an opinion and a punch uh, also readers can uh, punch back, but <laughs> that's another story. At any rate, um, I have, um, I'm going to show a handful of my cartoons uh, out of the hundreds I've done on climate and environmental. I prefer the, the word just environment, the broad term of uh, uh, cartoons. So, um, I'll start with a really simple one. Uh, Sarah, could you show the first cartoon? Whoops, nope, the back one, the, the one you just showed. Back up to our new climate. This is like your basic editorial cart, political cartoon, contrasting um, what our world has become to um, uh, the when when you know a, a government makes a big deal about planting a few trees in a park somewhere and then allowing the pipelines to go uh, around or through it. It's not to denigrate trees. I I've planted trees too, but as a public policy, you know, it it has to be in balance with um, uh, what else is going on. Um, the other good thing about cartoons is that it doesn't have to be these big global issues. You can stick to what's going on in your community. Next. This is from uh, the early 1980s, my first job at the San Jose Mercury News, and it was about dumping metal in the San Francisco Bay. So a few companies dump waste metal into the bay. So big deal. So the fish are metallic now. Next. Um, as Jesse has uh, talked about, uh, I'm also interested in the environmental, uh, the social justice parts of environmental, uh, environmentalism. This is a two part cartoon uh, about the uh, water problems in Michigan. 
It's uh, I don't, separate but next and Flint, Michigan. This was when their lead problems were so bad and the uh, pollution in their water. And uh, I had seen ahead of time Jesse's work and that beautiful, <laughs> that very clever uh, animation. And I wanted to show an old cartoon. It's about a 12 year old cartoon, uh, also about uh, climate justice and Africa. Next. This Earth Day, if everyone unplugs just one gadget, uh, again, it's the way we talk about environmentalism. Um, versus the way that people in vastly different circumstances experience it. Next. Um, this is the first part of a cartoon about another part, uh, another of our environmental difficulties that we no longer talk a whole lot about. Um, in the beginning, next, and in the present which is, of course, population growth. Um, the more people we have, the more land we use, the more water we use, the more gas we use. And um, so I, it's, I don't do very many on them, but it's, it's something I, I care about. And I'm sorry people don't talk about it more. Um, next. Now, Back to our uh, one of the things that has been going on lately with all of our uh, recent hurricanes and storms. This is dangerous beachfront flooding. And again, I, I don't use climate change. Um, I don't use that as a word. It's too broad and, and not specific. Um, development, de building along our beaches, our coastlines, our waterways. Uh, that's what I'm talking, uh, that's what, if there are, if there isn't a house on the beach, it won't get flooded, even if there is a terrible storm. So I'm, I use that and I, I also like the, um, using the pipeline. Um, it's not just oil, it's a pipeline of all sorts of uh, uh, destructive behaviors. And, but um, this is, uh, not everybody has a house on a beach, but I like to show in cartoons that we all pay for those houses on the beach. Next. And here we are, the taxpayers holding it up. Didn't we meet last time we bailed out, uh, we rebuilt this beach? Um, I talked to an insurance adjuster recently who has, who has written, um, uh, has, has given insurance claims to five different times on the same home in Houston. How is, how is that possible? And those are all underwritten by, or most many of them are underwritten by FEMA. Next. Um, and I also like to make sure that, or I'm not blaming other people, that we're all in it together, uh, or all we all have some responsibility. This was after the um, the the the, the um, big oil spill uh, in in the Gulf Coast. Um, it's four parts: drill, baby, drill. Next, spill, baby, spill. Next. Kill, baby, kill. There were people, the workers were killed in that accident. And lastly, fill, baby, fill. Uh, until we change our ways, uh, we're the ones using, or many of us are the ones using uh, the oil those, those rigs bring out of the ground. But I occasionally try to be a little more upbeat. So here's one. This is two parts. Last century's energy panel, oil, coal, and gas. Next, this century's panel. Um, go for uh, putting those solar panels on our roofs, especially in the cities where uh, we have lots of flat roofs and could do lots of panels. 
And lastly, because this is uh, right before Thanksgiving, this is a cartoon I did at Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. Just remember to give thanks to our Mother Earth. And thank you all for having me. Dick, and, and I'm so glad you proved me right, Signe. You what? <laughs> you nailed it. I mean, it's another way of communicating these issues. And I think you're right. It is about the environment. Uh, more than just climate change, but we're all in this together. It's this weave that everyone talks about. And um, I think I just lost everything. Uh, fuck. Um, I can't see anyone now, and I must have touched something. But can you hear me, everybody? Just let me know. I can hear you. Okay. Um, if... Uh, Sarah comes in, she can figure it out. But I want to open it up to questions. Um, but maybe we should have a little discussion. OK, we're back. Uh, perhaps a discussion with all of us now. Are there any conversations, any thoughts that you guys have after hearing these wonderful presentations? Jesse, you're shaking your head. So shoot. I do. I, um, I want to say that I was really tickled by Signe's uh, work. And, and the humor and irony is so important in getting across these points and the juxtapositions. But there are two points that came up that I think need to be challenged deeply. One is the blaming climate uh, problems, in fact, on population growth. Yeah. It simply yeah. doesn't pan out. Right. It doesn't pan out. It's been an old racist, yeah. racist trope for a long time. Uh, we correlate, uh, you know, we don't, the, the density of population in the Amazon is low, and that's where the most deforestation is. No one looks in the middle of New York City for deforestation. There are a lot more people. Most of the damages are due to a few people with high levels of wealth. That's one thing. Secondly, I don't like the blame the victim or blame the user thing. Neither in the Phil baby Phil, I don't blame people for using their cars nor in the go out and plant trees. I don't think individuals are going to fix this. I think that individuals have a role. Tree planting is lovely, but it is too tiny just the way Signe's illustration shows. And it is going to be government. And I mean, it has to be good government. We need to work on that. But it is going to be government that is going to have to make policies and regulations and be transformative at scales that we can hardly imagine if we are to actually reduce our imprint upon this planet. Well, I would like to, um, I would agree with the first point and disagree with the second point. Mm -hmm. So like the, as the only brown woman on this panel, I will say yes, I'm very offended by the population um, slide. It's, it's blaming women, it's blaming, you know, Bangladesh has uh, 150 million people, but we have very low carbon footprint. Um, the, the US and North Americans individually have, have the highest carbon footprint really, you know, except for, for, for a few Gulf countries. But I will, I will disagree with Jesse See on the other front. And I think obviously we have different philosophies. This is not to have a fight. But I think that um, I, you know, worked in government for a while. I'm a former lawyer. And I don't think that we can just rely on government and wait for government to do something. And what the, what has what has our government done? The US government has completely, you know, disrupted and made it impossible to have any global agreement on things. And so I think we can't wait for the government. I think artists and individuals need to take things into our own hands and work in our communities. And and, and, and it doesn't come from the government. The government is us, right, Jesse? I mean, we, I am the government, you are the government. So we have to get all of us involved in the government. So exactly. this idea, but that, but I think so, so for every person to know, to understand um, and, to, and to also be, and I think I, I agree that we should not be blaming individuals, but I think the blame, you know, but you can't just also put your head in the cloud and say, oh, a lot of young people I talk to say, oh, it's just industry that's doing it and they don't really Realize that in fact the highest the, the main contributors to global warming in this country number one are the heat and energy that we use in our homes and number two is mobile sources that's our driving that's our flying and industry is number three at least according to the EPA maybe they're lying I don't know but but I think so we have to take it we have to do it all 
So I agree with you, but I also think the individual um, and, and our own co local communities is very important. Absolutely. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in? Lauren, you look like you're being very thoughtful with this question. Um, I'm just really enjoying the argument. <laughs> this is what we need to be doing. I just need to take out Chinese food on the table. <laughs> okay. Can I say one thing about population? Go oh, there. Uh, look at look at what's happening down uh, on the Colorado River into Arizona. The reason that that river and and L.A. I mean, the reason you don't have water down there is because so many people have moved down and are uh, uh, not just people, but industries um, using that water. I mean, there are millions of people flocking to those two areas and the water gets drained, you know, gets uh, drained so that the, the rivers are no longer the rivers. Um, I mean, so, so I think, I, I mean, I'm not trying to blame, I don't, you know, I, I, I believe me, I've done many, many cartoons about the, the effects, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on racism as a whole, and, and this intermingled. I'm not blaming people for having uh, children. I had children. <laughs> and grandchildren. <laughs> but um, I just... I just, can I just jump in uh, uh, and just say that I don't think that the reason there's a water shortage in the Intermountain West has to do with people um, and population. It has to do with the fact that water was stolen from indigenous communities and redirected where we wanted it to go. And, and actually, um, in the 19th century, after the Civil War, when um, the West used to be Chicago, <laughs> and we decided to sort of go farther and try and figure out Manifest Destiny, which was the great desire for the new United States to become a global imperial power like the European ones that it was emulating. The idea of controlling the continent as a way to control trade with Asia um, really pushed westward expansion. And um, an army general, uh, what John Wellesley Powell, actually drew up a map for the United States, which talked about a, a very different mapping of the Intermountain West, where communities, he thought, should be built in the arid lands where the water was, mm -hmm. rather than using strategies of moving water where we want it. So... You know, I think, again, it's important to recognize that, you know, we we made short term decisions um, based on historical precedent. I mean, people have been the whole Roman Empire moved water <laughs> where they wanted it to go. This the whole idea of colonization, the whole idea of colonization of things that ought to be construed as our commons is something that really needs to be taken into consideration for next generation thinking that we that we can't continue to think that we can colonize things that are the commons of all of life if you don't uh if we don't want to um extinguish ourselves yeah what you're talking about it has to do with people moving to cities i think it's much more complicated than that it's complicated, but I think you hit the nail on your head when we have not, as the indigenous populations have, acknowledged nature and how nature and we are one and we can't control it and we can't tell the rivers where to go, right? And that's that's what we've been doing. Man has been overpowering nature, thinking they can conquer it. And uh, nature's conquering. It's speaking up because we messed up. Big time. Um, we have very little time left. I'm. We have about five more minutes. So um, I'm going to try to wrap it up, but I want some more. Com this conversation is fantastic. And do, uh, do we have any um, uh, questions from our audience? Uh, I don't think that. I think there's a little bit of a mix up with the questions. Um, I'm waiting to hear. And so far, we don't have any. That's why I'm thrilled that the conversation is so lively. Okay, I'll throw in one other little bomb since <laughs> I came down on Amtrak. And if you go through, when you go through Maryland, um, you go farm, 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 and then huge warehouse, huge warehouse, 
huge warehouse with trucks lined up, you know, so that you could do a perspective drawing on them. And this is, again, the way we live in the United States, that now we everything has to be in an Amazon truck. Those, mm -hmm. those warehouses are paving the landscape where, right. our, where the birds and are supposed to be living and whatever animals are left on our earth. Um, so, I, you know, it's it, it, the idea of our um, conquering nature is still going on. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, it's something that, that uh, I love to cartoon about. Steamrollers are very, very good graphically. Very good. It, it, it's really true. Um, I, I'm just thrilled with the conversation and with all the work that you guys are doing. Uh, thank you, American University, for helping to organize, for organizing. There's a shout out to Maggie, who couldn't be with us, and Simon Nicholson, who was so important in organizing this. Uh, we have a keynote by Devi Lockwood that's coming up at 3.30, which is why we're rushing a little bit here. Uh, she has written a book called A Thousand and One Voices um, on Climate Change. And uh, hopefully you guys out there in virtual land will be able to join us in our next session. Thank you very much. And I'll remind you, everything is recorded. You will be able to do that again. I thank you all. Uh, thank, Laura, you, Diane. thank you, Diane. Really. Thank yeah. you, Diane. Thanks, thank everyone. You, Diane. And congratulations on your exhibition. Exactly. Thank Everyone you. should go see Diane's exhibition. It's beautiful. Take care. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.